Marion Mitchell Morrison, born Marion Robert Morrison, May 26, 1907 June 11, 1979, known by his stage name John Wayne, was an American film actor, director, and producer, and Academy Award winner for True Grit, 1969, Wayne was among the top box office draws for three decades, an enduring American icon, for several generations of Americans he epitomized rugged masculinity and is famous for his demeanor, including his distinctive calm voice, walk, and height. Born in Iowa, Wayne grew up in Southern California. He found work at local film studios when he lost his football scholarship to USC as a result of a body surfing accident. Initially working for the Fox Film Corporation, he mostly appeared in small bit parts. His first leading role came in Raoul Walsh's lavish widescreen epic The Big Trail, 1930, which led to leading roles in numerous B-movies throughout the 1930s, many of them in the Western genre. Wayne's career took off in 1939, with John Ford's stagecoach making him an instant mainstream star. Wayne went on to star in 142 pictures. Biographer Ronald Davis says, John Wayne personified for millions the nation's frontier heritage. 83 of his movies were westerns, and in them he played cowboys, cavalrymen, and unconquerable loners extracted from the Republic's central creation myth. Wayne's other well-known western roles include, as a cattleman driving his herd north on the Chisholm Trail in Red River, 1948, as a Civil War veteran whose young niece is abducted by a tribe of Comanches in The Searchers, 1956, and as a troubled rancher competing with an eastern lawyer for a woman's hand in marriage in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962. He is also remembered for his roles in The Quiet Man, 1952, Rio Bravo, 1959, and The Longest Day, 1962. In his final screen performance, he starred as an aging gunfighter battling cancer in The Shootist, 1976. He appeared with many important Hollywood stars of his era, including Maureen O'Hara, James Stewart, Dean Martin, and Natalie Wood. Early life, John Wayne was born Marion Robert Morrison on May 26, 1907 at 224 South 2nd Street in Winterset, Iowa. The local paper, Winterset Madisonian, reported on page 4 of the May 30, 1907 edition, that Wayne weighed 13 pounds at birth. His middle name was soon changed from Robert to Mitchell when his parents decided to name their next son Robert. Wayne's father, Clyde Leonard Morrison, 1884-1937, was the son of American Civil War veteran Marion Mitchell Morrison, 1845-1915. Wayne's mother, the former Mary Molly Alberta Brown, 1885-1970, was from Lancaster County, Nebraska. Wayne's ancestry included Scottish, Scots-Irish, Irish, and English. He was brought up as a Presbyterian. Wayne's family moved to Palmdale, California, and then in 1916 to Glendale, California, where his father worked as a pharmacist. A local fireman at the station on his route to school in Glendale started calling him Little Duke because he never went anywhere without his huge Airedale Terrier, Duke. He preferred Duke to Marion, and the nickname stuck. Wayne attended Wilson Middle School in Glendale. As a teen, he worked in an ice cream shop for a man who shot horses for Hollywood Studios. He was also active as a member of the Order of Demolay, a youth organization of the Freemasons. He played football for the 1924 league champion Glendale High School team. Wayne applied to the U.S. Naval Academy, but he was not accepted. He instead attended the University of Southern California, USC, majoring in pre-law. He was a member of the Trojan Knights and Sigma Chi fraternities. Wayne also played on the USC football team under coach Howard Jones. A broken collarbone injury curtailed his athletic career. Wayne later noted he was too terrified of Jones's reaction to reveal the actual cause of his injury, a body surfing accident. He lost his athletic scholarship, and without funds, had to leave the university. As a favor to USC football coach Howard Jones, who had given silent Western film star Tom Mix tickets to USC games, director John Ford and Mix hired Wayne as a prop boy and extra. Wayne later credited his walk, talk, and persona to his acquaintance with Wyatt Earp, who was good friends with Tom Mix. Wayne soon moved to bit parts, establishing a longtime friendship with the director who provided most of those roles, John Ford. Early in this period, he had a minor, uncredited role as a guard in the 1926 film Bartolus the Magnificent. Wayne also also appeared with his USC teammates playing football in Brown of Harvard, 1926, The Dropkick, 1927, and Salute, 1929, and Columbia's Maker of Men, filmed in 1930, released in 1931. Film career, early career and breakthrough. While working for Fox Film Corporation in bit roles, Wayne was given on-screen credit as Duke Morrison only once, in Words and Music, 1929. In 1930, director Raoul Walsh saw him moving studio furniture while working as a prop boy and cast him in 
in his first starring role in The Big Trail, 1930, for his screen name, Walsh suggested Anthony Wayne, after Revolutionary War General Matt Anthony Wayne, the Fox Studios chief Winfield Sheehan rejected it as sounding too Italian, Walsh then suggested John Wayne, Sheehan agreed, and the name was set, Wayne was not even present for the discussion, his pay was raised to $105 a week, worth dollar today, The Big Trail was to be the first big budget outdoor spectacle of the sound era, made at a staggering cost over $2 million, using hundreds of extras and wide vistas of the American Southwest, still largely unpopulated at the time. To take advantage of the breathtaking scenery, it was filmed in two versions, a standard 35mm version and another in the new 70mm grandeur film process, using an innovative camera and lenses. Many in the audience who saw it in grandeur stood and cheered. Unfortunately, only a handful of theaters were equipped to show the film in its widescreen process, and the effort was largely wasted. Despite being highly regarded by modern critics, the film was considered a huge box office flop at the time. After the commercial failure of The Big Trail, Wayne was relegated to small roles in A Pictures, including Columbia's The Deceiver, 1931, in which he played a corpse. He appeared in the serial The Three Musketeers, 1933, an updated version of the Alexander Dumas novel in which the protagonists were soldiers in the French Foreign Legion in then contemporary North Africa. He played the lead, with his name over the title, in many low-budget poverty row westerns, mostly at monogram pictures and serials for Mascot Pictures Corporation. By Wayne's own estimation, he appeared in about 80 of these horse operas from 1930 to 1939. In Riders of Destiny, 1933, he became one of the first singing cowboys of film, albeit via dubbing. Wayne also appeared in some of the three Mesk White Ears westerns, whose title was a play on the Dumas classic. He was mentored by stuntmen in riding and other western skills. Famed stuntman Yakima Canada and he developed and perfected stunts and on-screen fisticuffs techniques still used today. Wayne's breakthrough role came with director John Ford's classic Stagecoach, 1939. Because of Wayne's B-movie status and track record in low-budget westerns throughout the 1930s, Ford had difficulty getting financing for what was to be an A-budget film. After rejection by all the top studios, Ford struck a deal with independent producer Walter Wenger in which Claire Trevor, a much bigger star at the time, received top billing. Stagecoach was a huge critical and financial success, and Wayne became a mainstream star. Cast member Louise Platt credits Ford as saying at the time that Wayne would become the biggest star ever because of his appeal as the archetypal everyman. America's entry into World War II resulted in a deluge of support for the war effort from all sectors of society, and Hollywood was no exception. Wayne was exempted from service due to his age, 34 at the time of Pearl Harbor, and family status, classified as 3A, family deferment. He repeatedly wrote John Ford saying he wanted to enlist, on one occasion inquiring whether he could get into Ford's military unit, but consistently kept postponing it until after he finished just one or two pictures. Wayne did not attempt to prevent his reclassification as 1A, draft eligible, but Republic Studios was emphatically resistant to losing him. Herbert J. Yates, president of Republic, threatened Wayne with a lawsuit if he walked away from his contract, and Republic Pictures intervened in the selective service process, requesting Wayne's further deferment. Wayne toured U.S. bases and hospitals in the South Pacific for three months in 1943 and 1944, with the USO by many accounts. Wayne's failure to serve in the military was the most painful part of his life. His widow later suggested that his patriotism in later decades sprang from guilt, writing, he would become a super patriot for the rest of his life trying to atone for staying home. U.S. National Archives records indicate that Wayne had, in fact, made an application to serve in the OSS, that day's equivalent of the CIA, and had been accepted within the U.S. Army's allotted billet to the OSS. William Donovan, OSS commander, wrote Wayne a letter informing him of his acceptance into the field photographic unit, but the letter went to his estranged wife Josephine's home. She never told him about it. Donovan also issued an OSS certificate of service to Wayne. Commercial success. Wayne's first color film was Shepherd of the Hills, 1941, in which he co-starred with his longtime friend Harry Carey. The following year, he appeared in his only film directed by Cecil B. DeMille, the Technicolor epic Reap the Wild Wind, 1942, in which he co-starred with Ray Milland and Paulette Goddard. It was one of the rare times he played a character with questionable values. He would appear in more than 20 of John Ford's films throughout the next two decades, including She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, 1949, The Quiet Man, 1952, The Searchers, 1956, The Wings of Eagles, 1957, and The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962, with James Stewart, the first movie in which he called someone Pilgrim. In 1949, 
director Robert Rawson offered the starring role of all the king's men to Wayne. Wayne refused, believing the script to be un-American in many ways. Broderick Crawford, who eventually got the role, won the 1949 Oscar for Best Male Actor, ironically beating out Wayne, who had been nominated for Sands of Iwo Jima. He lost the leading role in The Gunfighter, 1950, to Gregory Peck due to his refusal to work for Columbia Pictures because its chief, Harry Cohn, had mistreated him years before when he was a young contract player. Cohn had bought the project for Wayne, but Wayne's grudge was too deep, and Cohn sold the script to 20th Century Fox, which cast Peck in the role Wayne badly wanted but for which he refused to bend. One of Wayne's most popular roles was in The High and the Mighty, 1954, directed by William Wellman, and based on a novel by Ernest K. Gann. His portrayal of a heroic co-pilot won widespread acclaim. Wayne also portrayed aviators in Flying Tigers, 1942, Flying Leathernecks, 1951, Island in the Sky, 1953, The Wings of Eagles, 1957, and Jet Pilot, 1957. The Searchers, 1956, continues to be widely regarded as arguably Wayne's finest and most complex performance. In 2006, Premier Magazine ran an industry poll in which Wayne's portrayal of Ethan Edwards was rated the 87th greatest performance in film history. He named his youngest son Ethan after the character. Later career, John Wayne won a Best Actor Oscar for True Grit, 1969. This came 17 years after his only other nomination. Wayne was also nominated as the producer of Best Picture for The Alamo, 1960, one of two films he directed. The other was The Green Berets, 1968, the only major film made during the Vietnam War to support the war. During the filming of the Green Berets, the Degara Montagnard people of Vietnam's Central Highlands, fierce fighters against communism, bestowed on Wayne a brass bracelet that he wore in the film and all subsequent films. In an attempt to capitalize on the popularity of Dirty Harry, Wayne took on the role of gritty detective MCQ in the 1974 crime drama. His last film was The Shootist, 1976, whose main character, J. B. Books, was dying of cancer, the illness to which Wayne himself succumbed three years later. According to the Internet movie, movie database, Wayne played the lead in 142 of his film appearances. Bat Jack, the production company co-founded by Wayne, was named after the fictional shipping company Bat Jack in Wake of the Red Wooge, 1948, a film based on the novel by Garland Rourke. A spelling error by Wayne's secretary was allowed to stand, accounting for the variation. Bat Jack, and its predecessor, Wayne Fellows Productions, was the arm through which Wayne produced many films for himself and other stars. Its best-known non-Wayne production was Seven Men From Now, 1950 which started the classic collaboration between director Bud Bodicher and star Randolph Scott. In the motion picture Herald Top 10 Money Making Western Stars poll, Wayne was listed in 1936 and 1939. He appeared in the similar box office poll in 1939 and 1940. While these two polls are really an indication only of the popularity of series stars, Wayne also appeared in the Top 10 Money Makers poll of all films from 1949 to 1957 and 1958 to 1974, taking first place in 1950, 1951, 1954, and 1971. With a total of 25 years on the list, Wayne has more appearances than any other star, beating Clint Eastwood, 21, into second place. In later years, Wayne was recognized as a sort of American natural resource, and his various critics, of his performances and his politics, viewed him with more respect. Abby Hoffman, the radical of the 1960s, paid tribute to Wayne's singularity, saying, I like Wayne's wholeness, his style. As for his politics, well, I suppose even cavemen felt a little admiration for the dinosaurs that were trying to gobble them up. Reviewing the Cowboys, 1972, Vincent Canby of the New York Times, who did not particularly care for the film, wrote, Wayne is, of course, marvelously indestructible, and he has become an almost perfect father figure. Personal life. Wayne was married three times and divorced twice. He was fluent in Spanish and his three wives, each of Hispanic descent, were Josephine Alicia Scenes, Esperanza Bohr, and Pilar Pallet. He had four children with Josephine, Michael Wayne, November 23, 1934, April 2, 2003, Mary Antonia Tony Wayne La Cava, February 25, 1936, December 6, 2000, Patrick Wayne, born July 15, 1939, and Melinda Wayne Munoz, born December 3, 1940. He had three more children with Pilar, Aisa Wayne, born March 31, 1956, John Ethan Wayne, born February 22, 1962, and Marissa Wayne, born February 22, 1966. Several of Wayne's children entered the film and television industry. Wayne's son Ethan was billed as John Ethan Wayne in a few films, and played one of the leads in the 1990s update of the Adam 12 television 
television series, his stormiest divorce was from Esperanza Bohr, a former Mexican actress. She convinced herself that Wayne and co-star Gail Russell were having an affair, a claim which both Wayne and Russell denied. The night the film Angel and the Bad Man, 1947, wrapped, there was the usual party for cast and crew, and Wayne came home very late. Esperanza was in a drunken rage by the time he arrived, and she attempted to shoot him as he walked through the front door. Wayne had several high-profile affairs, including one with Marlene Dietrich that lasted for three years and one with Merle Oberon that lasted from 1938 to 1947. After his separation from his wife, Pilar, in 1973, Wayne became romantically involved and lived with his former secretary Pat Stacy, 1941-1995, until his death in 1979. She published a biography of her life with him in 1983, titled Duke, A Love Story. Wayne's hair began thinning in the 1940s, and he started wearing a hairpiece by the end of that decade. He was occasionally seen in public without the hairpiece, notably, according to Life magazine, at Gary Cooper's funeral. During a widely noted appearance at Harvard University, Wayne was asked by a student where did you get that phony hair? He responded, it's not phony, it's real hair. Of course, it's not mine, but it's real. A close friend of Wayne's, California Congressman Alfonso Bell, wrote of him, Duke's personality and sense of humor were very close to what the general public saw on the big screen. It is perhaps best shown in these words he had engraved on a plaque, each of us is a mixture of some good and some not so good qualities. In considering one's fellow man it's important to remember the good things. We should refrain from making judgments just because because a fella happens to be a dirty, rotten sob. Wayne biographer Michael Munn chronicled Wayne's drinking habits. According to Sam Osteen's memoir, Cut to the Chase, studio directors knew to shoot Wayne's scenes before noon, because by afternoon he was a mean drunk. He had been a chain smoker of cigarettes since young adulthood and was diagnosed with lung cancer in 1964. He underwent successful surgery to remove his entire left lung and four ribs. Despite efforts by his business associates to prevent him from going public with his illness for fear that it would cost him him work, Wayne announced he had cancer and called on the public to get preventive examinations. Five years later, Wayne was declared cancer-free. Wayne has been credited with coining the term the big C as a euphemism for cancer. Wayne's height has been perennially described as at least six feet. He was a Freemason, a master mason in Marion McDaniel Lodge No. 56 F and AM, in Tucson, Arizona. He became a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason and later joined the Al Malika Shrine Temple in Los Angeles. He became a member of the York Rite. During the early early 1960s, John Wayne traveled extensively to Panama, during which he purchased the island of Taborsillo off the main coast. It was sold by his estate at his death and changed hands many times before being opened as a tourist attraction. Wayne's yacht, the Wild Goose, was one of his favorite possessions. He kept it docked in Newport Harbor and it was listed on the U.S. National Register of Historic Places in 2011. Politics Wayne was a prominent Republican in Hollywood, supporting anti-communist positions. Throughout most of his life, Wayne was a vocally prominent conservative Republican. Initially a self-described socialist during his college years, he voted for Democratic President Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1936 presidential election and expressed admiration for Roosevelt's successor, fellow Democratic President Harry S. Truman. He took part in creating the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals in February 1944, and was elected president of that organization in 1949. An ardent anti-communist and vocal supporter of the House on American Activities Committee. In 1952 he made Big Jim McLean to show his support for the anti-communist cause. Recently declassified Soviet documents reveal that, despite being a fan of Wayne's movies, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin contemplated Wayne's assassination as a result of his frequently espoused anti-communist politics. Wayne supported Vice President Richard Nixon in the presidential election of 1960, but expressed his vision of patriotism when John F. Kennedy won the election, I didn't vote for him but he's my president, and I hope he does a good job. He used his iconic star power to support conservative causes, including rallying support for the Vietnam War by producing, co-directing, and starring in the critically panned The Green Berets in 1968. Due to his enormous popularity and his status as the most famous Republican star in Hollywood, wealthy Texas Republican Party backers asked Wayne to run for national office in 1968, as had his friend and fellow actor Senator George Murphy. He declined, joking that he did not believe the public would seriously consider
consider an actor in the White House. Instead, he supported his friend Ronald Reagan's runs for governor of California in 1966 and 1970. He was asked to be the running mate for Democratic Alabama Governor George Wallace in 1968, but he rejected the offer and actively campaigned for Richard Nixon. Wayne addressed the Republican National Convention on its opening day in August 1968. For a while, he was also a member of the anti-communist John Birch Society. Wayne openly differed with the Republican Party over the issue of the Panama Canal, as he supported the Panama Canal Treaty in the mid-1970s. Conservatives had wanted the U.S. to retain full control of the canal, but Wayne believed that the Panamanians had the right to the canal and sided with President Jimmy Carter and the Democrats. Wayne was a close friend of the late Panamanian leader Omar Torrijos Herrera, and Wayne's first wife, Josephine, was a native of Panama. His support of the treaty brought him hate mail for the first time in his life. In May 1971, Playboy magazine published an interview with Wayne which resulted in a firestorm of controversy. Wayne expressed his support for the Vietnam War, and made headlines for his resolute opinions about social issues and race relations in the United States. I believe in white supremacy, until the blacks are educated to a point of responsibility. I don't believe giving authority and positions of leadership and judgment to irresponsible people. I don't feel we did wrong in taking this great country away from Native Americans. Our so-called stealing of this country from them was just a matter of survival. There were great numbers of people who needed new land, and the Indians were selfishly trying to keep it for themselves. In the same Playboy interview, Wayne also responded to questions about whether entitlement programs were good for the country, I know all about that. In the late 20s, when I was a sophomore at USC, I was a socialist myself, but not when I left. The average college kid idealistically wishes everybody could have ice cream and cake for every meal, but as he gets older and gives more thought to his and his fellow man's responsibilities, he finds that it can't work out out that way, that some people just won't carry their load. I believe in welfare, a welfare work program. I don't think a fella should be able to sit on his backside and receive welfare. I'd like to know why well-educated idiots keep apologizing for lazy and complaining people who think the world owes them a living. I'd like to know why they make excuses for cowards who spit in the faces of the police and then run behind the judicial sob sisters. I can't understand these people who carry placards to save the life of some criminal, yet have no thought for the innocent victim, death. Although he enrolled in a cancer vaccine study in an attempt to ward off the disease, Wayne died of stomach cancer on June 11, 1979, at the UCLA Medical Center, and was interred in the Pacific View Memorial Park Cemetery in Corona del Mar, Newport Beach. According to his son Patrick and his grandson Matthew Munoz, a priest in the California Diocese of Orange, he converted to Roman Catholicism shortly before his death. He requested that his tombstone read F.E.O., Fuerte y Formal, a Spanish epitaph Wayne described as meaning ugly, strong, and dignified. The grave, which went unmarked for 20 years, is now marked with a quotation from his controversial 1971 Playboy interview, Tomorrow is the most important thing in life, comes into us at midnight very clean. It's perfect when it arrives and it puts itself in our hands. It hopes we've learned something from yesterday. Among the cast and crew who filmed the 1956 film The Conqueror on location near St. George, Utah, 91 developed some form of cancer at various times, including stars Wayne, Susan Hayward, and Agnes Moore head, and director Dick Powell. The film was shot in southwestern Utah, east of and generally downwind from the site of recent U.S. government nuclear weapons tests in southeastern Nevada. Many contend that radioactive fallout from these tests contaminated the film location and poisoned the film crew working there. Despite the suggestion that Wayne's 1964 lung cancer and his 1979 stomach cancer resulted from nuclear contamination, he believed his lung cancer to have been a result of his six-packs-a-day cigarette habit. Legacy. Award celebrations, and landmarks. Wayne's enduring status as an iconic American was formally recognized by the U.S. government in the form of the two highest civilian decorations. On May 26, 1979, he was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. Hollywood figures and American leaders from across the political spectrum, including Maureen O'Hara, Elizabeth Taylor, Frank Sinatra, Mike Frankovich, Catherine Hepburn, General and Mrs. Omar Bradley, Gregory Peck, Robert Stack, James Arness, and Kirk Douglas, testified to Congress in support of the award. Robert Aldrich, President of the Directors Guild of America, made a particularly notable statement. It is 
important for you to know that I am a registered Democrat and, to my knowledge, share none of the political views espoused by Duke. However, whether he is ill-disposed or healthy, John Wayne is far beyond the normal political sharpshooting in this community. Because of his courage, his dignity, his integrity, and because of his talents as an actor, his strength as a leader, his warmth as a human being throughout his illustrious career, he is entitled to a unique spot in our hearts and minds. In this industry, we often judge people, sometimes unfairly, by asking whether they have paid their dues. John Wayne has paid his dues over and over, and I'm proud to consider him a friend and am very much in favor of my government recognizing in some important fashion the contribution that Mr. Wayne has made. Wayne was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom on June 9, 1980, by President Jimmy Carter. He had attended Carter's inaugural ball as a member of the loyal opposition, as he described it. In 1998, he was awarded the Naval Heritage Award by the U.S. Navy Memorial Foundation for his support of the Navy and military during his film career. In 1999, the American Film Institute, AFI, named Wayne 13th among the greatest male screen legends of classic Hollywood cinema. Various public locations are named in honor of Wayne, including the John Wayne Airport in Orange County, California, where a nine-foot bronze statue of him stands at the entrance, the John Wayne Marina for which Wayne bequeathed the land, near Squim, Washington, John Wayne Elementary School, P.S. 380, in Brooklyn, New York, which boasts a 38-foot mosaic mural commissioned by New York artist Knox Martin entitled John Wayne and the American Frontier, and a 100-plus mile trail named the John Wayne Pioneer Trail in Washington's Iron Horse State Park. A larger-than-life-size bronze statue of Wayne atop a horse was erected at the corner of La Cienega Boulevard and Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills, California, at the former offices of the Great Western Savings and Loan Corporation, for which Wayne had made a number of commercials. In the city of Maricopa, Arizona, part of Arizona State Route 347 is named John Wayne Parkway, which runs through the center of town. In 2006, friends of Wayne and his former Arizona business partner, Louis Johnson, inaugurated the Louis and the Duke Classics events benefiting the John Wayne Cancer Foundation and the American Cancer Society. The weekend-long event each fall in Casa Grande, Arizona, includes a golf tournament, an auction of John Wayne memorabilia, and a team roping competition. Several celebrations took place on May 26, 2007, the centennial of Wayne's birth. A celebration at the John Wayne birthplace in Winterset, Iowa, included Chuck Wagon suppers, concerts by Michael Martin Murphy and Riders in the Sky, a Wild West review in the style of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, and a cowboy symposium with Wayne's co-stars, producers, and costumers. Wayne's films ran repetitively at the local theater. Ground was broken for the new John Wayne Birthplace Museum and Learning Center at a ceremony consisting of over 30 of Wayne's family members, including Melinda Wayne Munoz, Aisa, Ethan, and Marissa Wayne. Later that year, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and First Lady Maria Shriver inducted Wayne into the California Hall of Fame, located at the California Museum for History, Women and the Arts. Cultural image is an American icon. Wayne rose beyond the typical recognition for a famous actor to that of an enduring icon who symbolized and communicated American values and ideals. By the middle of his career, Wayne had developed a larger-than-life image, and as his career progressed, he selected roles that would not compromise his off-screen image. At a party in 1957, Wayne confronted actor Kirk Douglas about the latter's decision to play the role of Vincent Van Gogh in the film Lust for Life, saying, Christ, Kirk, how can you play a part like that? There's so goddamn few of us left. We got to play strong, tough characters, not these weak queers. By the time of his last film The Shootist, 1976, Wayne refused to allow his character to shoot a man in the back as was originally scripted, demanding I've made over 250 pictures and have never shot a guy in the back. Change it. Wayne's rise to being the quintessential movie war hero began to take shape four years after World War II, when Sands of Iwo Jima, 1949, was released. His footprints at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood were laid in concrete that contained sand from Iwo Jima. His stat this grew so large and legendary that when Japanese Emperor Hirohito visited the United States in 1975, he asked to meet John Wayne, the symbolic representation of his country's former enemy. Wayne is the only actor to appear in every edition of the annual Harris Poll of most popular film actors, and the only actor to appear on the list after his death. Wayne has been in the top 10 in this poll for 19 consecutive years, starting in 1995.
1974, 15 years after his death, John Wayne Cancer Foundation. The John Wayne Cancer Foundation was founded in 1985 in honor of John Wayne, after his family granted the use of his name for the continued fight against cancer. The foundation's mission is to bring courage, strength and grit to the fight against cancer. The foundation provides funds for innovative programs that improve cancer patient care, including research, education, awareness, and support. Legal problems with Duke University, Newport Beach, California-based John Wayne Enterprises sells products such as Kentucky Straight Bourbon using Wayne's picture. When the company tried to trademark the image appearing on one of the bottles, Duke University in Durham, North Carolina filed a notice of opposition. According to court documents, Duke has tried three times since 2005 to stop the company from trademarking the name. The company wants a federal judge in Orange County, California, to declare that both brands can be allowed. The company's complaint filed in federal court says the university does not own the word, Duke, in all contexts for all purposes. The university's official position is not to object if Wayne's image is used, but if the company wants to use the Duke name without Wayne, the university says, we are also committed to protecting the integrity of Duke University's trademarks. Richard Howell, an attorney for John Wayne Enterprises, said the company supports a co-use agreement, though he believed the name Duke would be more likely associated associated with Wayne than with the university. On September 30, 2014, federal judge David Carter dismissed the suit against Duke University, saying the jurisdiction was incorrect. Filmography Between 1926 and 1976, Wayne appeared in over 170 motion pictures, and became one of America's biggest box office stars. Only Clark Gable sold more tickets than Wayne, although the ticket prices were not commensurate since, although both actors started their careers at the same time. Gable's career height preceded Wayne's by approximately 15 years. Missed roles. In 1948, Wayne was offered the role of Jimmy Ringo in The Gunfighter, a script that Columbia Pictures had purchased specifically for him. Wayne turned it down, despite having expressed a strong desire to play the part, because of his long-standing feud with Columbia's president, Harry Cohn. Columbia sold the rights to 20th Century Fox, where the role went to Gregory Peck. Wayne's final film, The Shootist, 1976, is often compared to The Gunfighter and contains Wayne's numerous plot similarities. Wayne rebuffed the lead role in the 1952 film High Noon because he felt the film's story was an allegory against blacklisting, which he actively supported. In a 1971 interview, Wayne said he considered High Noon the most un-American thing I've ever seen in my whole life, and that he would never regret having helped run Carl Foreman, out of the country. An urban legend has it that in 1955, Wayne turned down the role of Matt Dillon in the long-running television series Gunsmoke and recommended James Arness instead. While he did suggest Arness for the part, and introduced him in a prologue to the first episode, no film star of Wayne's stature would have considered a television role at the time. Terry Southern's biographer Lee Hill wrote that the role of Major T. J. King Kong in the 1964 film Drive, Strange Love was originally written with Wayne in mind, and that Stanley Kubrick offered him the part after Peter Sellers injured his ankle during filming, he immediately turned it down. In 1966, Wayne accepted the role of Major Reisman in The Dirty Dozen, and asked Metro Goldwyn Mayer for some script changes, but eventually withdrew from the project to make the Green Berets. He was replaced by Lee Marvin. Though Wayne actively campaigned for the title role in Dirty Harry, in 1971, Warner Brothers decided that at 63 he was too old, and cast the 41-year-old Clint Eastwood. Mel Brooks offered Wayne a cameo appearance in his 1974 film Blazing Saddles. After reading the script Wayne declined, fearing the dialogue was too dirty for his family image, but told Brooks that he would be first in line to see the movie. Awards and Nominations Academy Awards. As shown below, Wayne was nominated for three Academy Awards, winning once for Best Actor in a Leading Role in 1970. Best Actor. The category's nominees for each year in which Wayne was nominated are shown, with that year's winner highlighted in yellow. Producer. Golden Globe. The Golden Globe Awards are presented annually by the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, HFPA, to recognize outstanding achievements in the entertainment industry, both domestic and foreign, and to focus wide public attention upon the best in motion picture and television. In 1953, Wayne was awarded the Henrietta Award, a now-retired award, for being world film favorite, male. The Cecil B. DeMille Award for Lifetime Achievement in Motion Pictures is an annual award given by the Hollywood Foreign Press Association at the Golden Globe Award Ceremonies in Hollywood. It was named in honor of Cecil B. DeMille, 1881-1959, one of the industry's most successful filmmakers. John Wayne won the award in 1966. In 1970, Wayne won a Golden Globe Award for his performance in True Grit, Brass Balls Award. In 1973, the Harvard Lampoon, a satirical paper run by Harvard University students, invited Wayne to receive the Brass Balls Award, 
created in his honor, after calling him the biggest fraud in history, Harvard Square had become known for leftist intellectualism and protest throughout the 1960s and 1970s. Wayne accepted the invitation as a chance to promote the recently released film MCQ, and a Fort Devens Army convoy offered to drive him into the square on an armored personnel carrier. The ceremony was held on January 15, 1974, at the Harvard Square Theater and the award was officially presented in honor of Wayne's outstanding machismo and penchant for punching people. Although the convoy was met with protests by members of the American Indian Movement and others, some of whom threw snowballs, Wayne received a standing ovation from the audience when he walked onto the stage. An internal investigation was launched into the Army's involvement in the day.